Can you believe that the dead can talk? Because some deaths are real, while others are merely stories, this is the essence of the long-awaited season 5 of the classic American TV show Prison Break, which fans have been anticipating for a whole 8 years. Do you recall the ending of season 4? The finale had Michael sacrificing himself for the freedom of others, yet this sacrifice wasn't his life but rather his own freedom. What deep conspiracy lies behind this? Let's find the answers together in Season 5. The story kicks off with Prison Break Soul, T-Bag, T-Bag, swapping his prison uniform, which he had worn for the better part of his life, for a long missed suit, because he was released from prison by a mysterious benefactor, the guards, cursing, remarked, how does trash like you get help? You're just damn lucky. After saying this, the guards handed T-Bag his belongings from before his incarceration, including a letter sent to him by someone else. T-Bag strutted towards freedom, but when he opened the letter outside, his face revealed a look of sheer terror. Meanwhile, Lincoln is back to being hounded by debt collectors, feeling lost ever since his brother's death, barely escaping his pursuers. Lincoln arrives home to find T-Bag, who mockingly comments on his current plight waiting for him, just as Lincoln is about to kick T-Bag out. T-Bag hands him an envelope. Lincoln, shocked, finds a photo of his brother Michael, believed dead for years, thinking it's another of T-Bag's tricks. Lincoln couldn't dispute the authenticity of the postmark on the envelope, disbelieving his eyes, and T-Bag equally puzzled. Lincoln reads the letter, but neither can decipher its meaning, resulting in T-Bag being chased away. Lincoln then rushes to New York to find Sarah, noticing a red car that seems to be tailing him along the way. However, the red car soon turns away, and then a black pickup starts following him, only to also turn away shortly after. Feeling secure no one is following, Lincoln finally reaches Sarah's place. Sarah, having remarried and formed a new family with her husband Jacob and her son, doubts the authenticity of the photo, suspecting it to be edited, especially given her distrust of T-Bag's character. She has accepted Michael's death and urges Lincoln to do the same. In the evening, Lincoln visits Michael's grave, reminiscing about the past. Overwhelmed by his memories, he takes another look at the letter under the setting sun, revealing embossed letters beneath. Lincoln sensed something was off. He took out a pencil and erased the letters that could be rubbed off, ultimately revealing the word Ojijia from the remaining letters. A quick internet search reveals it to be a prison in Yemen, to prove the truth. Lincoln ventured alone to the graveyard in the dead of night, picking up a shovel to begin digging. Upon opening Michael's coffin, he was so shocked that he collapsed to the ground. A closer look revealed no body inside. Lincoln was so excited that he hugged Michael's clothes, which proved that Michael was probably still alive. As Lincoln prepares to inform Sarah, the red car that had followed him reappears. Lincoln cast a wary glance but noticed nothing out of the ordinary. Yet, as the green light flashed on, the person in the red car casually tapped a few keys on a computer, causing Lincoln's vehicle to uncontrollably accelerate and charge forward with fierce speed. With the brakes failing, Lincoln unbuckles his seatbelt and crashes into a barrier, throwing himself into the river. He picked up Michael's clothes and headed towards the shore. At that moment, the man followed him. Lincoln quickly hid behind a large tree. Just as the man was about to come over with a gun to check for a body, his plan was disrupted by onlookers who suddenly arrived prompting him to leave hastily. Lincoln hurriedly called Sarah to tell her. Before they could finish speaking, the black pickup that had been following Lincoln pulled up in front of Sarah's house, followed by a blonde woman armed with a gun approaching. Sarah, grabbing a gun, calls the police while running upstairs to find Mike, hiding in the bathroom with him and preparing to defend themselves with a dismantled towel rack. Downstairs, Jacob is shot in the leg, and the woman ascends the stairs. Just as she's about to open the bathroom door, police sirens grow louder, and the assailant leaves hastily. After confirming the assassin had left, Sarah quickly administered first aid to Jacob, then rushed him to the hospital. Lincoln arrived in time and expressed his desire to take Sarah with him to search for Michael. But Sarah, now with a new family and her husband in the emergency room, couldn't join him. Lincoln, understanding her situation, declared he would go to Yemen to look for Michael. Meanwhile, T-Bag, freshly out of prison, arrived at a hotel. He intended to look for some special services online when a hospital appointment email suddenly popped up on his screen. It was a meeting set with the director of the Prosthetic Research Center for 9.30 the next evening. T-Bag was curious. He had never made such an appointment, but then he thought about his prosthetic hand that indeed needed replacing, so he decided to meet the doctor as scheduled. The doctor was aware of T-Bag's condition and waited until after hours to receive T-Bag in order to avoid unnecessary trouble. 
He explained he had developed a cutting-edge prosthetic arm that could be controlled by the human brain, functioning no differently than a regular arm. This technology had received significant funding under the condition that Teabag would be the first recipient. Teabag suddenly remembered the phrase from the letter, through thy hands, the glory of the future is unveiled, realizing it must have been written for him. Thus, Teabag agreed to the prosthetic arm installation, instinctively. He asked the doctor not to use anesthesia, fearing what might happen while he was unconscious, but this wasn't the kind of sketchy clinic he was used to, concerned that the doctor might have ulterior motives while he was out. The doctor reassured him, I wouldn't dare cross someone like you, having allayed Teabag's concerns. The doctor gave Teabag a general anesthetic. When Teabag woke up and saw the prosthetic arm installed, he suspected the doctor might have implanted something else inside him and pressed for the name of the person behind this. The doctor didn't know who the mysterious person was, leaving only the word Udis to represent them. In Greek, Udis means nobody. On the other side, Lincoln, determined to go to Yemen to find his brother, sought out Benjamin, who had military experience in the Middle East and might provide some help. At this point, Benjamin had become a devout follower of Islam. Lincoln showed Michael's photo to Benjamin, hoping he could find some valuable clues. After analysis by Benjamin's colleagues, the building behind Michael in the photo was identified as the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The map showed this building was not far from Ojijia prison mentioned in the letter, with no other buildings in between, indicating the photo wasn't forged. But when Benjamin called the prison to inquire, he was told there was no prisoner named Michael, guessing Michael might have changed his name. Lincoln tried to find a photo of Michael online to send to them, only to discover that all of Michael's photos had been replaced with those of someone else. Lincoln then realized someone was trying to erase all records of Michael, prompting him to urgently prepare for his trip to Yemen. Benjamin warned him that the area was in turmoil, and ordinary people wouldn't survive there for three days. But Lincoln was determined to save his brother, even if it meant going through hell and high water. Returning to the hotel, Lincoln donned Michael's old suit. Although it was a bit ill-fitting, he hoped it would bring him luck in finding Michael. Just then, someone quietly entered the room. Alert. Lincoln swung a punch, only to find out it was Sucre. Sucre had heard the news that his good friend Michael wasn't dead and hurried over to join the search for him. Lincoln did not want to put Sucre in danger, but Sucre followed Lincoln to the airport. As the two argued, Benjamin suddenly arrived. Mentioning he knew some of the mosque's followers in the area who could find someone to meet them, Sucre interrupted their conversation, insisting that if Benjamin could go, he definitely could too. Then, Benjamin delivered a metaphorical slap to Sucre with a string of Arabic phrases, leaving Sucre completely dumbfounded in an instant. It turns out, Benjamin had picked up some Arabic during his service in the Middle East. Lincoln told Sucre to wait for their good news and that they would call him if needed. Thus, Sucre left, albeit reluctantly. Thanks to Benjamin's connections, the two set off for Yemen, unaware that the assassin who had been after Lincoln was now tracking them. Yemen was embroiled in conflict, with everyone trying to flee the country, yet they were entering. Soon, an elderly man with white hair greeted them, believing he was the contact sent to meet them. The two didn't think twice before following him out of the airport. Then, a middle-aged man holding a sign with Lincoln and Benjamin's names appeared. The driver took them to an abandoned warehouse, and it was only then they realized they had walked into a trap as several thugs surrounded them. Benjamin handed Lincoln a hammer and took a wrench for himself. These thugs clearly underestimated their opponents, as they were quickly overpowered and left lying on the ground. Checking the thugs' phone, Lincoln found out they had been discovered while boarding the plane. At that moment, the real contact, Sheba, appeared. Her informant at the airport had noticed Lincoln and Benjamin getting into the wrong car and had followed them here. Lincoln and the others threw away all their phones to prevent further tracking by the assassin. Upon arriving at the place Sheba had arranged for them, Lincoln suddenly noticed the word Udis printed on his brother's clothes, identical to the message left by the person who had donated the prosthetic arm to Teabag. Sheba introduced them to Omar because he had connections inside Ojijia prison. Omar mentioned that there was an American in the prison who matched the description of Michael, but getting a visit was extremely difficult. Lincoln immediately thought it was just a matter of money, which he had. However, Omar wasn't interested in money, as in this turbulent country, money had lost its importance, but passports were highly sought after. Benjamin advised Lincoln not to give up his passport, as without it, he couldn't return to the United States. But eager for the chance to see Michael, 
Lincoln didn't hesitate to hand over his passport. They soon arrived at the prison, which was more brutal than Sona prison. Sheba asked the guard about a prisoner named Michael, but the guard firmly denied any such person. Fortunately, Benjamin thought to show the guard a photo of Michael, and the guard said the man was known as Udi's. Remembering the name on Michael's suit, Lincoln told the guard they wanted to see him. Considering Sheba had brought them, the guard agreed to let them visit Udi's. Sheba, hearing they were looking for this person, angrily turned and walked away. It turned out Udi's was a notorious terrorist imprisoned for murder. Michael was quickly brought up by the guards, seeing his brother after seven years. Lincoln was overwhelmed with emotion, unable to express his feelings. Michael now bore new tattoos. Lincoln urgently asked Benjamin to take out his camera to prove Michael was alive. But when Lincoln spoke of rescuing Michael, Michael claimed he wasn't Michael and didn't know them, then asked the guards to take him back to his cell. After finally finding his brother after so many years, only to be denied recognition, Lincoln was nearly driven to despair. In the prison cell, the narrow space was extremely oppressive, its conditions rivaling those of Sona prison. After the guard finished patrolling the room, Michael asked his bunkmate, Whip, for a wrench and then removed the ventilation panel from the ceiling, preparing to climb onto the roof. His roommate, Sid, kept watch while Michael and Whip quickly made it to the rooftop. This was their seventh consecutive day there, waiting for the signal to escape. A double flash of the city's lights meant that the escape would begin in 24 hours. But after waiting half the day, there was still no sign. Watching the war spread outside, Whip grew anxious, fearing they'd soon become cannon fodder, and cursed loudly. Michael reassured Whip, telling him not to worry because he had a plan B, which he hadn't wanted to use. But now it had begun. The next day, Lincoln and Benjamin were still puzzled over why Michael refused to recognize them. Just then, they heard footsteps at the door. Lincoln opened the door to find a child who, upon seeing Lincoln, ran away, with Lincoln chasing after him but quickly losing track in the unfamiliar surroundings. After Lincoln returned, Benjamin handed him the origami crane left by the child at the door. A signature message from Michael. Lincoln unfolded it to see the handwriting was indeed Michael's. The note inside read, Find the Sheik of Light, and I will regain my freedom. Lincoln finally felt relieved, realizing Michael's refusal to recognize him was likely due to fear of being discovered by others. Now, their task was to find the Sheik of Light, but they had no clue who that might be. Benjamin decided to seek Sheba's help, who was at that moment trying to persuade her father to leave the city. However, Sheba's father knew they didn't have the funds to escape the country, leaving Sheba feeling helpless. When Benjamin arrived with Lincoln, Sheba reacted as if she'd seen an enemy. In her eyes, the person Lincoln wanted to save was a terrorist who had persecuted their country, and she swore she'd never help again. But Lincoln pulled out a stack of money, willing to make a deal with Lincoln to get the money needed to escape the war zone with her father. Sheba took the note from Lincoln, although she had never heard of the Sheik of Light and guessed it was a code. Noticing a piece of tape on the note, Sheba peeled it off to reveal a series of holes, which she guessed might be a phone number. She tried calling and reached the voicemail of Muhammad, the region's electrical engineer. Lincoln was sure this man was the Sheik of Light Michael had referred to. They drove to the electrical engineering department, where they learned Muhammad had gone to the suburbs a week ago to look for his trapped daughter. After getting the address, Sheba marked it on the map for Lincoln, advising them to go alone since the suburbs were on the front line of the war, posing a life-threatening risk. However, since Lincoln had yet to pay, he still had the upper hand. To get the money, Sheba had to help find the Sheik of Light, so she reluctantly led them toward the battlefield. Soon, they arrived at a government checkpoint, where soldiers warned them that going further was akin to a death sentence. Lincoln then pulled out money, betting with the soldiers that if he didn't come back, the money was theirs. The soldier then ordered his subordinates to open the gate and let them pass. Seeing the once bustling streets now in ruins, with walls plastered with portraits of the terrorist Abu. However, this Abu had already been imprisoned in Ojijia prison, the same prison where Michael was being held. Should Abu escape, the situation would undoubtedly be worse than it already was. Just then, their vehicle was spotted by the enemy. Sheba told Lincoln and the others to quickly duck inside the car. Soon a man approached to talk. And coincidentally, they knew each other. From their conversation, it was evident they had an unpleasant past, but now they were irreconcilable enemies. As the talk seemed about to escalate into trouble, they suddenly received news of an attack by government forces and hurried off to confront it. This allowed them to escape the situation without harm. However, when they arrived at Muhammad's location, they were suddenly confronted by a group of rebels at the entrance, with no other choice. 
They had to climb over a wall from another spot to enter. As soon as they entered the house, they were ambushed by Muhammad, who had been hiding, thinking the rebels had broken in. After confirming their identities, they wanted to take Muhammad with them, but he refused to leave unless his daughter was rescued. Muhammad disclosed his daughter's location to Lincoln, but the rebels outside seemed to have heard noise inside the house and were desperately searching around. It seemed not only could they not rescue the people, but they would also be trapped. At that moment, Muhammad mentioned there was a back door they could escape through, but they were a step too late as enemy vehicles had already parked at the back door. When they felt out of options, Lincoln instructed them to hide on the roof while he sneaked to the pickup truck. When the enemy is not looking Lincoln throws him out of the car in a couple of moves. Then he goes to the window to inform Muhammad's daughter to prepare to escape. Lincoln started the enemy's pickup and took Muhammad's daughter and the students away, quickly meeting up with Sheba's vehicle. Just as they were celebrating their imminent success, an enemy vehicle equipped with a heavy machine gun approached, and they desperately headed towards the city. The government forces noticed them, knowing that charging directly at the government checkpoint would be mistaken for a terrorist's suicide attack. Sheba stopped in advance and waved a white cloth. The government forces identified the enemy vehicle and opened fire directly at the machine gunner. Seeing Muhammad's daughter and the students successfully rescued, Sheba's impression of Lincoln changed dramatically. After they settled down, it was only after Lincoln's interrogation that they found out he was the Sheik of Light, also the father of Michael's roommate, Sid. Sid had been sentenced to 20 years in prison for falling in love with another man. As homosexual relationships are forbidden in this country, a few weeks ago, Muhammad visited his son in prison, where Sid told him that if he could manage to cut the city's power, someone could help him escape from prison. The plan had been arranged to take place a week ago, but it was delayed due to his daughter being surrounded by terrorists, which is why Michael had been climbing to the rooftop for seven consecutive days waiting for a signal. Lincoln said they were still in prison waiting for your message. Hearing this, Muhammad hurriedly got up ready to act, because their agreement was to give them a double flash 24 hours before the blackout, but whether this city could last another 24 hours was still in question. Meanwhile, far away in New York, Sarah was sending Mike to school when she suddenly received a video from Lincoln, seeing Michael, whom she thought had died years ago, still alive. Sarah was moved to tears. At that moment, her husband Jacob, who was still in the hospital, called. Sarah answered the phone trying to sound calm. Jacob felt like Sarah knew something she shouldn't, but she diverted the conversation. Later, Sarah went to the government department seeking help, only to be received by Deputy Director Paul. Having had some previous issues with him, Sarah worried she might fall into a trap again and thus turned to leave. However, hearing Paul mention information about Michael, she couldn't help but follow her curiosity into his office. Paul pulled up the terrorist Udiz's file, which shockingly had Michael's photo, and it matched previous records exactly. Only a few people, including a genius like Michael, could pull off something like this. Paul suspected it might be Michael's own plan, but Sarah didn't believe these claims and turned to leave the office. Just as Sarah got home, Paul sent her an email. The surveillance footage in the email showed Michael personally killing the deputy director of the CIA and then moving the body. The next day, Michael boarded a plane to Yemen. As soon as Michael got off the plane, the CIA began their pursuit. Although Michael managed to escape, he didn't have time to take his luggage, which contained clothes with the victim's blood. Hearing this incontrovertible evidence, Sarah didn't know what to do. She confided in her current husband, Jacob. Jacob explained to Sarah using his knowledge of game theory. He said Michael would sacrifice anyone to achieve his goals and always had his own schemes. He also mentioned that Michael approached Sarah only to escape from prison and would leave as soon as his objectives were met. This, according to Jacob, was the real face of Michael. Despite these absurd explanations, Sarah couldn't believe Michael would become like this. Meanwhile, Michael was in prison, making meticulous plans to communicate with the outside world. He set his sights on his roommate Ja's phone. Ja a top-notch hacker from South Korea and a bona fide addict. No one knew how he managed to bring a phone into prison. He could hack into financial systems of various countries from home, which led to his imprisonment. To get Jaws' phone, Michael's next actions were astonishing. He asked Sid for a piece of gum and then took off the foil wrapper, tearing it into a strip about 8 millimeters wide. He attached the foil's ends to the positive and negative terminals of a battery. The thin foil was quickly ignited due to the short circuit. Then, he used the generated fire to boil water, and then soaked a towel in the boiling water. Wrapping the hot towel around his head, Whip quickly called the guards, saying Udi's had a high fever that needed immediate treatment. This way, Michael successfully made it to the infirmary. However, 
Since he was considered a terrorist, the guards loathed him deeply and took out their frustrations on Michael. Soon, Michael was beaten to a bloody pulp, after which the guards gave him two pills. Michael pretended to swallow the pills, then was sent back to his cell. Michael spat out the unswallowed pills and told Ja, who was addicted to drugs, that they were derivatives of morphine. Hearing morphine, Ja perked up, but Michael said he could only have them if he could borrow his phone to order a pizza. The scene shifts to Sarah in New York, picking up her son from school. However, after all the kids had left, she couldn't find Mike. Sarah frantically searched and fortunately found Mike in a nearby park. Mike handed his mother a paper rose, saying a pizza delivery guy gave it to him. The paper rose, once a symbol of Michael's undying love for Sarah, had a message written on it. The storm is coming. All beings must hide. Sarah intuitively felt Michael was in trouble. Meanwhile, Michael was in prison, waiting for the chance to escape. At that moment, Sid came over and said the leader of the terrorist group, Abu, was closing in on them. Since it was the month of Ramadan, Abu, who was in solitary, would be released back to the general cell block, where heretics, sinners, and foreigners would be killed by them. Just then, the lights flickered twice. Sid realized someone had found his father, meaning the escape was set to begin in 24 hours. However, what they didn't expect was that the terrorist Abu and his followers had already been released. Sid and others were scared and hid, but Michael stood still. Abu looked at his own blood-stained hands and put them on his face to smell them. Then he walked straight towards Michael. Unexpectedly, they embraced each other like brothers. Abu asked if he had planned the escape. Michael, with full confidence, said, it officially starts tomorrow night. 